Take a deep breath wherever you are. In your bed or on a walk or in the car. Even though you're probably not on a walk or in the car, because I'm Take a deep YouTube. breath if you please. Are you ready? Bits and the Bobs. The Bits and the Bobs. I've been listening to this podcast called Poog. Did I tell you about it? No. Okay, you know Rachel Price of Lake Street yeah. Dive? Oh, you did tell me about it. Yes, yeah, so I've been listening to Poog. I, I ri- originally thought that I didn't really like this, the series. I thought that I just liked the one episode I listened to, but then I've been listening to a lot of them, and they will just spend an hour. <laughs> I listened to two episodes about one of them discussing how she was at a hotel for some conference or something and she ordered room service and got this burger that was not cooked like to the medium that she wanted it and they literally spent two episodes like two hours discussing like this this issue of ordering room service multiple times whether or not to ask for a different kind of cook because um and now I realize that I'm giving it more airtime by talking about how much they've talked about the burger not mundane it is mundane, but like it's entertaining. Wow. Um, it's just like an okay. interesting style of podcasting where they will talk about just anything. It's like so random, so casual. It's kind of like you're just like a fly on the wall of their conversation. And it's it's a specific style, but I I've been I've been consuming that and I appreciate it for what it is. Um and so I feel like in this podcast I would be I would enjoy having more just like casual, natural organicness to it. Well, we're very good at casual. Con- I would prefer it to be like casual conversation because yeah, it, I feel nervous about being recorded and being asked questions. Yeah, I don't have any planned questions for you, really. That sounds good. I just think I'll be awkward. Sure. <laughs> Is that I wine? Some- wine? <laughs> yeah, I got some awkward juice. <laughs> uh, maybe I should. Maybe I should go get some awkward juice. I have some. Go get some. I'm gonna go get some. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if I could see myself in her computer screen, uh, but I can't. So that was why I waved. Anyway, I'll probably cut this out. Mm. Awkward juice. This is really good Moscato, by the way. 349 from Trader Joe's. Um, oh, <laughs> you caught me talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> this wine that I'm drinking, Bluefin, mm-hmm. Bluefin Moscato, this bottle is $3.49 and it's 10%. So it is incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly good bang for your buck and it tastes like juice. It's so fucking good. Does it, so it, t- it tastes good? It doesn't taste like $3 wine? No, it tastes, tastes like juice, like what you'd want a Moscato to taste like. <laughs> well, the wine I'm drinking today is a bold red, cool. uh, $10. So I'm a big baller. <laughs> well now that you have your awkward juice um do you do you want do you want do you want to introduce yourself again <laughs> <laughs> want to give them another shot <laughs> should we take shots <laughs> uh yes i will introduce myself again hopefully better this time i'm rachel i <laughs> good evening um i'm originally from the seattle area like an, i grew up a little north of Seattle. I went to undergrad with dear, dear Maya here at University of Washington. And then after I graduated, I moved to Austin and did an AmeriCorps. And then I just moved to Denver, I guess, four or five-ish months ago to start my graduate program in social work. Awesome. I want to pause because I'm too hot and I need to wear a t-shirt and not this long. Oh, same. I was, I was like, I need to pause because I have to turn off my heater. <laughs> Let's do that. What do you think, what circumstances would have to align or be achieved for you to feel like an adult? Because I don't think it's, I don't think it's age based. Personally. It's not. I'm a part of me is like thinking about people I know that are like in their thirties or forties and how 
they have a job or you know whatever it is and they go to bed really early and they <laughs> and they don't drink copiously anymore and they're in a stable relationship and they just watch their movie at like in at 7 p.m and then they go to bed at 8 30 type thing <laughs> but that's not the kind of adult I want to be I don't think <laughs> what kind of adult do you want to be I, I still want to be adventuring and having fun and not get settled into the whole you know it's it's just too much hassle to go out type mm-hmm. thing or too much hassle to bear the traffic because <laughs> I feel like people say that a lot I mean even people our age even people younger yeah. I guess it's more of just a type of person rather than adult versus not adult. But this also sounds very judgmental. Like I don't, you know, respect to these people that are valuing their own time and valuing their energy and protecting that. Because if that's what's right for you, then power to you. Mm. I just don't think that's what would be right for me. Yeah. I think that there's almost like a bi-directional condescension that comes with our associations with age and adulthood, because I think my my feeling is that I would have some disdain for that type of lifestyle, that like routine, uh, there's like a dreariness to it that I imagine with that sort of like capitalist routine, like I'm just going through the motions to pay my bills and um, that does not appeal to me. Um, but I also think that with that image of that type of lifestyle and that type of person, they would have condescension to like young people who go out you know like there there is that like mm-hmm. narrative um of like oh you're you're still young you still have your mm-hmm. youth it's I think it's judgmental both ways that can be harmful because when I do want to stay in and go to sleep at a decent hour then I I feel some self-judgment about being boring and about being mm-hmm. yeah I don't know not taking advantage enough of my youth Oh, absolutely. I feel the same way. I I get such intense FOMO whenever I decide to prioritize my rest and my health. And I, that's something I want to work on and something I want to allow myself to do more often because um, we, I mean, we have to preemptively rest or else we'll be forced to rest when we get sick. And that's just not how I want to live my life. Resting when you just feel okay, feels really good too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I want to read that quote now. It was from the mm-hmm. Poog podcast. Ah, okay. It's like my thing about shame-free naps. I think it's really important to take shame-free naps so that you don't manifest illness in order to give yourself the right to nap. So you're not manifesting a headache so that you can lay down. That was from the Poog New Year's resolutions episode at 58 minutes and 35 seconds. And That's specific. I know. Well, I think it's important to give credit where credit's due. Absolutely. I love the way they put that. I love that too. Like. The, I because I, I feel like I've done that for, I mean subconsciously obviously but manifesting sickness or manifesting a headache and taking advantage of your youth is also pushed from other people too and from especially from older people like mm-hmm. I do have quite a few older friends in, in my program and they do say that a lot where they're like oh my god you're so young or like I'll say I had to I stayed up super late one night and then had to wake up early and they were like oh I wish I could do that because you know I could never do that because I'm not in my 20s type thing um, I'm in just, my 20s and I cannot do that no I know me either I don't feel like I did it I've done it well or I've been happy <laughs> it's just happened yeah I wonder where that comes from that kind of like regret and advice that we get from older people who have this like take advantage of it like don't waste it because I wish that I had taken more advantage of it I where do you think where do you think that comes from I mean the, the first thing that's coming to mind is sentiments of like unfulfillment is that a word I think so <laughs> unfulfillment in either their current life or in the life that they had when they were younger if if you peak and then it's all, all downhill from there that's not that's just that feels sad to me mm-hmm. we do have a societal notion that that's what happens like you peak <laughs> in your, or at least you peak in like a vivacious and like I don't know zesty way like passion and exuberance for life like that mm-hmm. I think there's a narrative that like we pass that by the time we're in our 30s or 40s which I agree is tied to fulfillment um and also tied to the kind of like model that we are taught to aspire to which is to have you know the, the American dream like that's that's what we are fed I think growing up like you get married and you have a house and you have a mm-hmm. job a stable job and you take a vacation once 
in a while and like that's that's it that's what you do for the rest mm-hmm. of your life mm-hmm. um you got to make the most of the time leading up to that before you're stuck and trapped in your routine but we don't have to have that routine we don't have to but it it also it's interesting that you say stuck in that routine because i feel like that idea of that kind of life is also what so many people will aspire to in the hopes of becoming happy right Mm -hmm. like what is happiness is it can it ever be this end goal or like all right i've reached it and i'm done and i've accomplished all i need to accomplish because it's it's interesting to hold both in thinking of that idealistic life of the white picket fence and being married and having the house and all this stuff when so many people aspire to it because they think that it will bring bring them happiness or they'll feel accomplished in some sense but then also it is associated with that routine and just falling into this suburban type flow of life yeah um Mm -hmm. the the oatmeal has an amazing comic called um how how to be how to be perfectly unhappy and it's about how happiness is an ephemeral emotion not something that you can like build and then sit atop for the rest of your life it's like i've achieved happiness this is my pile of happiness and i'm just gonna live on here forever yeah i I like to reframe that as like like i think even contentment is a better pursuit than happiness but what do you think is the difference between contentment and happiness i think it's connotation and like a linguistic difference but for me contentment is sort of this more like sustainable relaxed grounded sort of like satisfaction like you look around and you're like yeah I have enough and I am content with where I'm at and I don't find myself grasping for more versus happiness feels to me like elation and like Mm. momentary dopamine like how you feel when you eat a donut or like you go clubbing which um you can't do all the time you can't like (laughs) always have really set your mind to it I don't know <laughs> no because the the joy would would decrease you know like by that third donut I don't think you're getting a dopamine hit in the same way that you would the first donut if you switch up the flavors you know <laughs> I know club every night <sighs> I'm tired mm. I'm so tired and I feel sad a little bit why do you feel sad just life not this conversation, just I've been sad the last co- the last couple of days. And I'm just, I'm tired from that and from life. Life is tiring. Mm-hmm. Life is uh, tiring. Yeah. I wanted to talk about our, um, our exhaustion with processing, because I think that that's really interesting and something that I did not expect um, yeah. into grad school and coming into therapy school and, and preparing to become a therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to start us off on that I feel like you should because we you kind of brought that into our conversation not not this conversation that sounds like accusatory but um, (laughs) you kind of brought up that idea first because I feel like you are also dealing with that a lot more take it it's been probably near a decade since I first really felt felt like this unquenchable thirst for deep conversations with people Somewhere around my adolescence, I was like, all I want is people to be able to have deep conversations with. Mm-hmm. And that shaped who I looked for in friends and like who I considered a quality uh, conversation partner, a quality relationship to have. It was the re- really the only barometer was somebody who was willing to go there with me and, and like be able to be vulnerable and be, be deep. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that probably started a decade ago. And it wasn't until a couple months ago that I was like, oh my God, I want to make small talk with people. (laughs) Like I have never, I can't remember ever wanting that. Like I, I detested small talk. And now I sometimes prefer to like talk about somebody's haircut for like 15 minutes or, um, you know, their dog, (laughs) like over getting into something that feels like heavy processing Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not that I don't like processing or don't want to do it, but I just feel much more like there just have to be more specific circumstances and, and parameters met for me to be in that headspace. I'm not just like walking around in that headspace all the time anymore where I'm just like ready to delve into a deep conversation. I feel much more 
protective of my energy now. And I think that that is a good thing. Not that there was anything wrong with not having that before, but I guess there's just a need for it now. I just feel a need to protect my energy more now. And you're more aware of it. My energy. Yeah. And just what it looks like to not have that protection versus having it Mm. and how that affects you and just all the intricacies of it. Right. Right. That makes me think of conversations and interactions I've had where I have revealed and shared things about myself and received just like wildly out of tune, out of pocket responses that Mm -hmm. led to like regret and feeling distant and disconnected. And um, yeah, just like that was not a good moment or a good person to divulge that information to. So yeah, part of it is that as well, um, that awareness. And also processing, I think, can go on forever. I think it can be like Mm -hmm. um, a thing that you can volley back and forth for any in eternity like right now if I were like Rachel how is what I'm saying right now landing for you and then you were to say well you know I'm actually noticing that I'm getting a little bit distracted because there's this bird flying outside my window and I feel guilty now sharing with you that I wasn't completely paying attention and then you that I wasn't completely paying attention (laughs) and then we could process how (laughs) it was for me that you're feeling distracted by what I'm saying and forever maybe that makes me feel anxious and then we process how my being anxious how how that lands for you that I'm feeling anxious you know you could go on forever and then we've spent 48 minutes discussing how the original thing I said landed for you but we've just we've just veered so far from that moment that it just feels like I feel like you could just forget what you're even talking about at that point um so that's one thing about processing that I'm still trying to grapple with and like come to some clarity on because I think there's a balance to be struck I think there's a way to do it where you are gaining helpful information about each other but I think it can also be done in a way where it's just like tedious and exhausting and futile Mm -hmm. and you could do it on about basically anything and so it's it's not even just because every conversation involves two distinct people that have distinct feelings and thoughts around the interaction so one person may think something went super well and the other person may not you can pro- you can process and go through that <laughs> like with anything and yeah. uh, you know it, I mean it never it just it can never end yeah well I, I I could imagine value to processing two people's very very different experiences of the same interaction like if one person felt really sad and the other person felt really excited and connected from the exact same interaction I could imagine there being value in them understanding each other better and like how um, certain interaction patterns um, affect their nervous system or affect them emotionally like it's data if you are like oh I didn't realize that the way that we talked about this um, brings up a lot of sadness for you like what can we do to you know, be aware of that going forward. Uh, I think there's value to that, but I also think that every interaction that we have, we're going to have different experiences of. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's, I mean, that was just kind of an example, but like, because we're all our own people, we're experiencing things differently. And so you could, you could process literally anything Mm -hmm. because, because there's always, there's, is always something to learn about how the other person experienced the same thing that you experienced. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is worth processing in your personal life, not not as a counselor. Mm. And I guess process with somebody else. Yeah. I think miscommunications happen mm. all the time. And that's, at least for me, that's always something I really, really want to talk about. But it's interesting because obviously I do a lot of processing in session with clients, but I, I honestly don't do much with my friends and in my interpersonal relationships. And that's something I want to do more, which is kind of a little different to what you're experiencing right now, feeling that like process burnout versus I'm like, let's get it going. Like, (laughs) where are you guys at type thing? Definitely miscommunications. I think in romantic relationships, it's very, very important to process feelings and, and specifically talk about what things mean to each person. And I mean, I guess in any relationship, like what does closeness mean to you and how, what does that mean to me? And what are your expectations for this relationship and going through like exactly 
what that means for each person. I'm kind of talking and I don't know what I'm saying. And it's words are just coming out at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Should we process that? <laughs> no. <laughs> what does processing mean to you mm. unless that was the question that you were just trying to tackle and then I just asked it again and you still don't know um that is kind of the same question I think I mean you have just a lot more experience in doing that in friendships and in in with classmates and everything mm. that I don't know if I can really speak to it as well, well. I'm curious about what it would look like to you I think for the most part processing is clarification like understanding fully somebody else's experience and how your words have affected somebody else yeah I guess that's what it is to me at a baseline and when you say that you want to do you want more of that in friendships what would that look like in the context of our relationship <laughs> um I don't know our relationship is so unique in that we talk about like everything <laughs> And I don't know, I feel like we kind of naturally process a lot. Yeah. Um, and because we also do think about things oftentimes in the same way and react in the same way, I don't think we come into much conflict that needs to be processed. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, in, in more like more casual friendships, I think hurt feelings and misunderstandings ha happen a lot more often because somebody isn't comfortable enough to say like that didn't really land right with me or something like that so I don't know I think more processing in those kind of casual relationships is what I'm interested in at this point in my life mm -hmm. I'm thinking about two things one how much joy it brought me to show you my foot skin on FaceTime the other day <laughs> <laughs> I had a great time <laughs> I loved seeing that. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're you're one of, if not my significant other right now in life. And I don't show my foot skin to everybody. I yeah, no, I, I don't show my metaphorical foot skin to anybody else either. <laughs> are you going to show me your literal foot skin? I could. My feet are pretty smooth right now. So I mean it's not much to look at, but feet are smooth now because I took my um what are these called? Uh, cuticle trimmers. I took those and I cut the like dead skin. Pocket. Oh, you cut it off? Well, I needed to because I was like picking the bubbles with my fingers and I like it went too deep in like two parts and it like it, it didn't bleed, but like it was definitely too deep because now when I stand without socks, I can like feel it's like a little bit raw there. So <laughs> that's why ripping is like not good. Yeah. <laughs> the cutting, but if they're smoother now. I can show you later. I would love to see it. <laughs> the other thing that I was thinking about um, with what you were just saying was this thought that I had the other day about kind of about processing. It's this idea that like, say I ask, I say, I tell you that I'm having a problem and you're like, here's what I think you should do about it. And in the moment for me, it lands like not well, because I'm like, I didn't want your solutions, Rachel. I wanted to just be heard and validated. I could... What, what I think most people do in our like in our conflict avoidant culture is to often give people the benefit of the doubt in a way that I think gets a bad rap sometimes as like, oh, you're just being conflict avoidant or, or you are um, afraid to say what you actually want or you're just like being a pushover. I don't know, something, something like that. I, I at least hold that kind of judgment or I, I did around not voicing something that I that I feel. Um, but what's interesting is I think that if I were to use that as an opportunity, as an opportunity to be like, Rachel, I was actually not looking for solutions. I was looking for validation. And then you were to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that I was trying to be helpful. And like, not, not in an invalidating way, but in a way that's like validating. And this is what was going on for me. What was going on for me was that if I were in that situation, I would have wanted a solution. And that's why I offered you a solution. Then I would hear that and be like, I would, I would be filled with compassion and understanding. And I'd be like, oh, well, it makes so much sense because you were just trying your best. But I feel like they're very similar shades as 
as the first one. Like the first one is sort of like an expedited version by giving somebody the benefit of the doubt you are assuming good intentions. Now, as I'm saying this, I think that there actually is a point to naming it because then the person will know for future reference. Like you're giving them data and they'll know next time either to ask or that you probably don't want a solution. So there is value in talking about it, but it does feel like if you can if you can access the benefit of the doubt in a way that is like empathetic and having compassion because you are assuming good intentions, I think that that is, you know, more efficient in a way. Unless unless you like actually want them to know for going forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the benefit of the doubt route also saves you a lot of anxiety in the situation where instead of feeling like angry, like, oh, I really needed validation and you just gave me a solution. Um, and I'm going to like fester about it and just like, you know, I, I, I feel like it saves you some hurt in that situation. If, if you're going straight to that compassion and not to say you're not allowed to feel your feelings in that sense of like, if that does hurt you, that's okay to name. But if you're able to access that, just like assuming like, okay, well, maybe next time I will, maybe even I'll say up front, like, here's my situation. I'm not looking for a solution. I'm just looking for validation. That's also information for yourself to know if like, that's what maybe where the person's going to go. So it really, yeah, I mean, it goes both ways. I love that. I love that. Yes. When I think about issues in communication and relationship, I often think about how communication more communication is needed so the other person so they can know because they can't mind read Mm -hmm. but I think that I don't often think about that piece of like you can there's half of it is on you like you very much can recognize this pattern in this person and speak up for yourself and preemptively let them know what you're looking for next time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah there is something that I think doesn't feel good about letting people know what you want because then I think if you are explicit in saying, Rachel, I want you to validate my feelings and here's how I feel. And then you do validate them. It's like, well, doesn't yeah, really was, genuine. yeah, she didn't have a choice. <laughs> like I told her <laughs> if I, if I say, Hey, can you make me dinner? And then you make chicken curry. And I actually wanted pizza. Like that's disappointing. But if I'm like, Rachel, can you make me pizza? <laughs> can you make pizza for dinner? And then you make me pizza. Then it's like, well, you had to. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so unique to the concept of validation, because if you were to say, this is my situation, can you offer me a solution? That is just so much more broad. And there's just so many different ways that a person can take that and run with it. But with validation, especially if it's say, it's something you feel really anxious about and you're saying like, oh, I need to, I need validation that I'm in the right. You may not be, you know, and that is kind of pigeonholing somebody into my mind just went blank. That's okay. I can also <laughs> cut out, I can also cut out silences. So you can take your time to think about words in the rest of your sentence. <laughs> That's wonderful to hear. Um, that'll probably help me a lot in those times when I just keep continue saying words because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay. What was I saying? Can you remind me of the last words that I said? <laughs> um, oh no. <laughs> Usually I'm good about this, but there's something in the air with us today, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just going to name that. I'm just going to name what's in the air here. <laughs> I'm going to name that I feel a little bit uh, like my energy isn't the best for recording a podcast today. I feel the same, yeah. Um, I'm still really glad to be here with you and doing this. And I feel like if it were a different day, the conversation might look a little bit different in a way that would feel just more, more energized and like slightly more present maybe. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Um, validating and, um, doesn't feel genuine. I was talking about pizza and you were, (laughs) (laughs) I think that one threw me off too. It's like necessarily get the pizza thing. (laughs) Yeah. And also like, what's wrong with asking for pizza and then getting pizza? Like that is yeah, how there, there's not like a bad thing about that versus no, like I think... asking for validation, getting validation could not be genuine. Yes. Yes. If it was like vegan pizza, right. 
no, that's still the nobody thing. wants that Rachel don't ever give me vegan pizza <laughs> no it's the worst I hate it <laughs> I think you're right my my pizza analogy fell a little bit flat for us both <laughs> <laughs> still you're you know it's still a workable analogy and you do have a particular skill for analogies you your mind just works well that way thank you usually typically it does today that one yeah it's fine but with validation here's a be- here's a better example um if somebody says I'm feeling really insecure about my looks and I'm I feel like I kind of need some validation about you know can you tell me that I look good that and then and then you get your friends saying you look so pretty wow you look great that doesn't feel real it doesn't feel real so yeah where's the line between that and actually asking for what you want and what you need yeah it's sort of like sorry go ahead no (laughs) (laughs) um versus just like taking what somebody says naturally and considering that despite whatever you feel like is what you need most in that moment because it it could be something else could be more helpful you're just unaware of it when you present the situation does that make sense say that again (laughs) say it again say again so in being open-minded and not maybe presenting what you need because we've been talking about how like asking for validation might not feel genuine when you receive it Mm -hmm. being open to other responses may introduce you to something you didn't know that you needed mm-hmm. in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think you'd have to, you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to be open though. Like if you, if yeah. you, you know that all you want is somebody to tell you that you look good. Mm-hmm. And then somebody says like, that was so thoughtful of you. I think if you were in an open place and that could be like, oh, that's affirming in this other way about this other aspect of myself. But if you are really fixated on validation about your appearance, that might not land well. So I think you're right that if you are if you are open to it, um, then you can get that validation in a different form. Mm-hmm. And of course, as we literally always say, it just depends on the situation and the person and what's going on. Yeah. Everything just depends. Yeah. I got, I got, uh, my letter of recommendation from my old supervisor couple yesterday for Ooh. practicum and unlike grad school, the practicum application site, the, the sites are like, just send it all to us in the pack in like one email. So, mm. so they don't care about the sealed letter. And I asked my supervisor to send it to me so I could send it to them and I read it and it was so nice. Like, I, I don't think I've read maybe once, but like Usually when people write letters of recommendation, it's like a sealed envelope. I don't see it. It goes right to yeah. the site. It felt so good. And there was a part of me that was like, this is only kind of real. Like hmm. it's it, so formative re- letters of recommendation. Uh, like who is out here writing a shitty letter of recommendation and sending it and just being like, haha, screw this person, you know? Well, I think there's different there's different calibers of bragging yeah. about. It was like this person was great and like they're really focused and on time. And then there's all the way up to like, this person is amazing and will blow you away. And you should absolutely take them on because they're great in this way, this way, this way, and this way. Like, is that what your supervisor said? It was pretty good. It was, <laughs> <laughs> of course. it was really, really nice. And I don't doubt that what she's saying is true to her. I don't doubt that it's genuine because it's not a black and white. It's not, is it genuine or is it forced? It's like, how forced was this? A little more flowery than maybe just would have happened in a casual conversation yeah and like there's probably a template that these people have and they're probably recycling a lot of sentences for all of their students mm-hmm. and that doesn't necessarily take away from how much they mean it about you but how are you supposed to know how much they mean it about you because they could be saying the same thing for eight different people and really mean it for two of them and like kind of mean it for the rest of them you can't know mm-hmm so sometimes it's hard to receive validation, I guess, is the point of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, guess. I, didn't, I didn't have a point so much uh, when I started. <laughs> no, that makes sense, though. It is hard because, yeah, I mean, even if it's completely unprompted, do we ever know how genuine someone is about anything, really? Like, that's trust, right? It's just trusting that someone means what they say. Yeah, But in certain things, especially in professional contexts where there is so much performance, 
I'm embarrassed because I'm thinking about this moment last night when I was at my gig and I was sharing a mic with this guy. I just met him. Um, <laughs> Intimate. Yeah. Yeah. So we were singing into this mic together and then I was having a good time. I was like harmonizing, doing my thing. And then the song wound down and I was like, you're a really good singer to him. And then he was like, thanks. You're a really good singer too. And I realized that as he said that, <laughs> I was like preparing for it. Like as soon as I gave him the compliment, <laughs> I like, I like was waiting for the, I was waiting for the response back. And then when I heard it, I was like, oh, thanks. And then I was like, I totally expected and wanted that. And like, maybe I just said that to him because I wanted to hear that from him. (laughs) (laughs) We do that all the time, don't we? Yeah. But in that moment, I mean, looking back in that moment, how much did I mean it to him? Like, can he trust the validation that I give him? Can any of us ever trust the validation that we're given? Um, I don't know. How would you have felt if you had said, you're a really good singer. And he said, thanks. I think I would have felt a little bit disappointed Mm -hmm. and and a little insecure. Like, oh no, because people are so nice. We live in a nice culture. We live in a nice. Always. Anytime you get a compliment, people feel the need to return one. Yes. We should talk a little bit about reciprocity because that's been on my mind too. And we think about that a lot, but um, can we end soonish though? Cause I'm getting tired. Yeah, that's fair. Feeling feeling like I need to perform. That's fair. I'm sorry. No, no. It's. I mean, it's that. T- t- it's the game. <laughs> it's the name of the game. It's the name of the game, man. <laughs> I'm uh, just. Not, yeah, I just being. It's it's the same as like when I talk in class. Like I can have a really coherent and like eloquent thought, and I'll say it out loud in front of people, or like when I'm being recorded, and I'm just like, ew. That's not what I meant. (laughs) Do you want to watch this back before I post it? Mm, Probably not. I don't know if I would ever want to watch it. (laughs) What motivated you to be here today? (laughs) Um, I mean, mostly you. Yeah. Like I want to do this because it, I mean, it sounded more fun in theory than I think now (laughs) only because of my own thing of like, the fact that I don't feel like I'm saying things the way that I want to say them or that I f- feels like most representative of who I am. We've gotten pretty, pretty meta at this point, but I mean, this is where we both thrive. I think is just getting all theoretical and like, what does this mean? Yeah. And talk, yeah. And talking about how things actually like what, I mean, what we're talking about now feels alive for me and, and alive for us, like processing and validation and yeah, totally relational things and reciprocity like I'm excited about those because they're things that I'm thinking about now yeah no I mean I agree I think what we've been talking about the second half is way more interesting um and just more like because there's so much nuance to it all but then I think I also get in my head about that because I'm like there is so much nuance so what if what I say just like vastly offends somebody because they're like what are you talking about you know yes that freaks yes. me out too I just get so in my head about just like the fact that this will be seen by people yeah they're gonna have their own thoughts about it but of course people do that when I'm just in a conversation that isn't recorded yeah yeah it's that idea I think that people can like scrutinize it and like yes. pause and replay it and it's just there forever yeah it doesn't have to be but yeah 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 in a conversation you overhear it but then you there's no proof that it happened it's yeah it disappears into history <laughs> Right, right. But here, that's guess- also what I'm scared about of like social media and the internet in general. You know, like you hear about so many people ruining their lives because of like, something they posted on Instagram or something like that. And that shit just freaks me out. Yeah. Half the days I think about just like deleting all my social media. No, I can't do it. I, and you know, I, I don't think it's just that I'm weak willed. I think that there actually is I- <laughs> what <laughs> yeah, I said you're not weak willed well it's partially that's that's, that's part of it I think you know like if I had no it's not that it's not that it's that I don't think the value of cutting all out of my life would exceed the cons of it right now yeah yeah Um, I agree even though it takes a lot it takes a lot of time out of Mm -hmm. my day it does I don't know what I would do with that time um probably, that's the thing it's like what I just sit here in silence I think you like work on yourself 
or something. <laughs> Work on yourself. <laughs> Yeah. I sit and contemplate how I can be a better person. <laughs> we were talking about that a while ago, actually, how both of us were feeling some fatigue around working on ourselves since being in grad mm. school, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, and this is also something that comes up with my clients all the time. And I think it's just common in the human experience of feeling like if we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. Mm. And that can get so tiring, especially because we know the elation that comes with making this like or having this giant revelation about the way that we work or the way that the world works that when you're not it's it, it's the same thing like we we're talking about earlier with like happiness and dopamine that it it's a dopamine hit and like you crave that and so when you're not getting it and when you feel like you're just not in a space to grow and to work on yourself that it's disappointing yeah and I think for me when I think about working on myself, I do think about it in that very specific way of like toiling, like mentally toiling towards some revelation. And yeah. when I have that revelation and things sort of click into, into place, there is this dopamine and this rush of like, oh, now I understand it. Now I can do something about it. Now I yeah. will do something about it and things will be better soon because I'm going to start doing something about it now. Hmm. And so I think that- Solution focused. Yeah, very solution focused. And I think that might be too narrow of a definition for what working on yourself looks like, because I mean, one of my New Year's resolutions this year was to do less, but like guiltlessly, like to, to tune in and see what I need most in a given moment and then give it to myself, whether that's a donut or yoga or watching an episode of TV or calling somebody, you know, like whatever it is, um, to follow that and while I have experienced a decrease in guilt around doing those things and probably a decrease in stress too around not being productive all the time, there is also a part of me that's like, I don't know, just like, yeah, not, I'm not doing enough. I'm not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, Which is society putting that on us, right? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't think that that that's an innate quality where we feel like we need to just keep like leveling up, you know, but especially in the US, very individualistic, very much career oriented, very accomplishment oriented. And that bleeds into every aspect of our lives, including just like self-development, which mm. it shouldn't, but it's the way we've been programmed. <laughs> yeah. Like if, if we lived in like remote villages off the grid with our friends, like, I don't think I'd be as obsessed about being a good enough, like becoming a good enough person no. or like not a good enough person, becoming like a really spectacular impressive amazing perfect person because mm -hmm. that's what we all want but yeah. it's unattainable yeah I would just be focused on like the chickens and um mm -hmm. staying alive <laughs> it, that's it is yeah. that better like maybe we're here now because we've evolved to this place where we have all of our needs met by modern conveniences so we have the luxury or the opportunity or you know as a reframe like we have the privilege and ability to work on ourselves that we wouldn't have if we didn't have all the technological conveniences that we have now 100 percent. like I'm very grateful that I have the privilege to be able to think about these things and not just worry about basic needs but then there is also the burden that comes with that right like not just living a simple life where you have to worry about staying alive and keeping the chickens from getting eaten by coyotes, <laughs> whatever it would be on this remote village. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's both painful and privileged, I think. Mm. Love that. I love that. I think it's true. And it also makes me think that where are we headed? Where are we headed as a civilization? Because are you familiar with chat GPT? I've told you about chat GPT, right? Have we not talked about this? Have we not? I've been talking about because, it to a lot of people. Because I had a whole, like, I was so freaked out by chat GBT. And I feel, <laughs> I was like, I feel like I was telling everybody about it and be like, have you heard of this? <laughs> this shit is crazy. Um, have, have we really not talked about it? Because that, it not freaks about me it. out. It freaks me out. Like, is no, this we, our- We've talked about this. I told you about how I was consulting it to go out on New Year's, right? Yes, yeah. we did. Yes, we did. It, it's- Oh, it's just scary. The, the capabilities of technology and how it can take away. Oh, and so many thoughts are coming in right now. We were talking a lot about like therapy and like if chat GBT and like these kinds of programs are just going to replace therapists, but there is that 
um, nuance of having the human experience and human emotion in your, in these responses from a therapist that you just cannot get from a compiled, you know, algorithm that's just pulling information from the internet, even though its responses are wildly human and really freaky. Well, here's the thing. I think that chat GPT can't replace therapists yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they could. I think you they just, probably could. You just yeah. feed it CBT manuals. You feed it oh. emotion-focused therapy manuals. You feed it narrative. Th- you feed it everything about what we know about psychotherapy and effective therapy. I think it could make it could come to a close enough replica that people would opt for it because it's free. They don't have to find you know the right person. They don't have to actually confess vulnerable things to another human who might judge them. Like there's totally a world in which that could be preferable for people. I don't think it will replace therapists completely for a very long time, but I don't know. I agree. Like, and you could even customize it to like the specific modality you want because every therapist these days that are integrated or eclectic or whatever it is, you know, versus you could say like, no, I want a CBT focused solution or I want these coping skills that are under this umbrella of this specific modality. And that is freaky because would it just do that? Or would it question like, well, what's the motivation behind that? Like a therapist would, you know, saying like, I mean, depending on the therapist, but I feel like the question I would ask is like, why are you wanting this very specific solution? Mm-hmm. Um, you, don't think, you don't think it could get to the point where it would have that kind of- Well, it probably could. It I freaks me out. <laughs> it freaks me out too. It freaks me out too. I feel like you could even go so far as to set the frame of it to be like, I want you to be, uh, you know, I want you to pull on the experiences of like queer Asian women therapists and for them to, and for it to replicate the mentality that like a queer person would have and like people of color's experiences in order to, in order to build that therapeutic alliance that's unique. Oh my God. I think it's possible. But then- in our quest for like a genuine experience, like we were talking earlier, like the fact that this is not genuinely a person, do you think just the words are enough to satisfy whatever this person wants? Or do you think that genuine human connection and that genuine response from a real therapist is what's really gonna do the trick, you know? Cause it doesn't feel real. I mean, it, I guess, I don't know. You could just imagine that it's a person typing these things, but when it's just an algorithm compiling this information, is that going to feel genuine? And is that going to feel real? I love how this is tying to our validation conversation. (laughs) I know. We can't even trust whether a letter of recommendation is real. We can't trust Mm -hmm. whether somebody saying you sound really good singing is real because it's always motivated by like an unconscious desire to have that reciprocated. Mm -hmm. Is anything real ever? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's where I, we've landed. <laughs> I think that if if a computer is saying what you're feeling is understandable and makes sense and it's okay that you're feeling that way I wouldn't mind hearing that from a computer I think that'd be comforting hmm. how would you feel how would you feel if you're like I'm feeling this way and it was like you know it makes a lot of sense that you're feeling that way given what you're going through it's hard with that phrase in particular because I use that so much and I receive that so much so it just feels so just like kind of run of the mill not in a bad way though because it is helpful but like I guess I guess that means that coming from a computer it would be fine because I am so used to it and I'm like yeah I do have a right to feel my feelings you know it works like it works That's- because it's it's validating and it's yeah it's comforting I guess Oof. I also feel like on some like kind of spiritual level that we are computers like we <laughs> like say more we- we are made of stardust like iron our blood like we our blood is just iron which is the sun and we are water like we are earth and we are just we're just a a combination of like planetary particles that's what we are and so everything we make is also that like everything else also comes from the earth and from metals and you can break everything down into like the periodic table of element like matter you know like everything 
is us. We are everything. It's all the same. We're all coming from the same universe of the same particles. And like, if you think about the way a computer works, it's not so different from a human. Like we, we take in information, we have an algorithm, we, we have a way of processing and storing this information. And then we use that information to like navigate the world using those preset like schemas and prototypes that we've acquired through society. Like, how are we different from a computer? Why can't we derive comfort and company? Yeah. Like Do you think a computer's ever going to be able to feel emotion? That's the main difference. And that's what makes us so perfectly flawed and beautiful is like the fact, like we were talking about earlier, the fact that we can all experience something differently, I think is not true of a computer. Mm. I guess if they have different algorithms, sure, but they're all being fed the same information. It's like, I don't know, there can be such a vast difference in the human experience. I don't know if a computer can ever achieve that and ever achieve like, do you think a computer's ever going to feel anxiety? But what does it even mean to feel something? Because I think that it could it could replicate emotional expression. Yeah, yeah, it could. But I don't know. I don't know if it could actually ever feel. Also, I think that if we get to the point where we're all buying our own individual robots from birth, like the robot has no previous knowledge, and then we feed it what we want, then they are going to be unique, and they are going to process and and think about things in a unique way. <laughs> to buy a your world, own a world in which we all have our own personal robots. <laughs> Yeah, you don't think that's where we're going? I I it's possible. There's so many dimensions. Yes, it might already be a reality somewhere. Mm -hmm. Probably is. Probably is. Originally when I brought this up because we were talking <laughs> where this came from. <laughs> we were talking about civilization and modern conveniences and what I was going to ask was as we've moved from villages to now and we're headed toward having chat gpt write all of our papers do all of our reading save us all this time if one if one product of having our modern conveniences our, our daily needs taken care of and we have all this extra time to work on like bettering ourselves and becoming good people where is that headed like if we have even more taken care of are we going to become more obsessed and focused and fixated on like self-enlightenment what would that look like the first, the first thing that comes to my mind is we can't have like beauty and happiness, which maybe I shouldn't use contentment is a better word then we can't have beauty and contentment without pain and struggle. And so if technology is automate, uh, what is the word I'm trying to think of? If technology is automating all of these different aspects of our lives, is that not just going to make life more mundane? And maybe we would have more time to focus on growth and self-development but if all of these minor inconveniences that we see as inconveniences right now are taken away then what are what are the moments where things feel really easy where are those you know where is where is the joy and the easiness if we don't have the comparison group of the struggle do you find joy in microwaving your food <laughs> not necessarily no but i'm saying like if we didn't have to microwave our food if we could just press a button and it just appeared then that takes away any joy it's you know it's like if you can just teleport to the top of mountain and you don't have to climb up there to get it to get that view is it even gratifying what you're getting at is that there is all the value is in the journey or the process if you will i love a full circle moment so, um, we've had so many full circle moments Although this this version of process is different from the type of processing we were talking about before, although maybe not, maybe maybe pro maybe the, <laughs> maybe the value in processing with another person feelings or relational content is going on that journey and is seeing does this does this result in us being more disconnected and dysregulated or is our foundation strong enough to hold this volley of processing? You know, maybe I don't know. That's a question. That's I just thought of that. But so now we have all of, we can microwave our food. We don't have, we don't often, I, I rely heavily on the microwave. The microwave is my, the only kitchen appliance that I use aside from the fridge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do occasionally use a toaster. <laughs> maybe, yeah, we're crazy you use a burner, but that's on a special occasion. No, I don't use a burner. That's too much cooking. I'd have to wash a pan. Um, and so I don't access the joy in the process of cooking my own food. And I think that there is joy to be found there in, you know, 
washing and cutting and prepping and this and that and cooking and sauteing and tasting it to your every you know desire um and I don't have that right now anyway and I do think that someday I will enjoy that process in a different house in a different kitchen but it gives me time to I guess enjoy the process of other things like making music yeah exactly what scares me about chat gpt and all of this ai is i would love for a world where we have all of our all of you know the basic things taken care of so that we can make more art because mm. i think art is everything but when ai can make art i have no idea what humans are gonna do what do i almost feel like we'll reach a point where we're just gonna throw it all away or we're gonna you know like most of us will die off and then we'll just restart we'll just we will just restart we're just going to go back to like the very very basics living off of farms yeah I, I feel like that's just the natural course of humans you know and and we see that in trends and stuff you know we we leave something and then if it has value we find ourselves coming back to it mm. type thing I feel like I don't know humans embody the full circle experience mm. you know when was the last time that you returned back to something that you'd forgotten or put aside um, mm. that you remembered you find value in? Oh, definitely volleyball. Like mm. I played volleyball. I was on the varsity team in seventh and eighth grade. We also didn't win one single game, by the way, in those two years, we didn't win one game. <laughs> so clearly we were not all that skilled, um, but I really enjoyed it then. But then getting into high school, I had so many other extracurriculars. I had like choir and that took up most of my time and academics, of course. And like I had done it before, but then I just kind of forgotten about it in my life. And then I came back and I was like, oh my God, how could I have forgotten about it? This is so much fun. <laughs> I love that. I love and admire that you sought that out for yourself and were brave enough to go step out into that world that you hadn't touched in, in so long. And I feel like you are living what you aspire to be as an adult um because I I sort of hold this idea of like sports band like if you want to be in a band or you want to be in a choir you have to be in school like there it's hard to yeah. find these outlets and community in the adult world when you don't have an institution just like mm -hmm. having all of these extracurriculars available um so I love that you went out and found that for yourself and I've been getting so much joy in it like yeah. if you have to break down um more specifically into what aspect of it brings you joy and um, fulfillment and excitement what would that be I mean part of it is definitely meeting new people and making new connections and there is something so unique about being on a team together that that bonds you even if you don't hang out in any other situation like you are working together towards this common goal mm -hmm. but I think most of it really is just like playing I think there's probably a competitive nature in me that doesn't get to be pulled out very often because, I mean, I love board games, but I, you know, I'm not going to be screaming and calling the ref out to to judge this Monopoly game, you know, because that's just a little absurd, but it's able to come out there in a, in a healthy way. <laughs> and, uh -huh. and um, I don't know, it, it, I mean, it's just a lot of fun. And especially when you do well and you work together well as a team, it's, there's just something so unique about it. I like imagining you screaming and, and calling out the ref in these games. I, had I had don't that. do that okay <laughs> still just you know going for the ball and all that stuff you know like diving I, I only dive in sand I would not dive on the ground because my friend it's still painful in sand though it still sounds it's really painful. not it's pretty soft you'd be surprised I would be <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you were describing being on a team and and working toward a single goal it reminds me of choir and yeah 100 percent I mean, it sounds more playful than choir, but maybe not. How, how is your experience of working on a team in this sort of like synchrony with other people similar and different in, right? I guess right now your acapella group or, or other experiences in choir compared to volleyball? I think it is so incredibly similar. And that's, I mean, that is that, that like team element is what I love so much about choir. And just everybody's working so hard because they want to sound good yeah. and just hearing the final product of, of that hard work and how it so seamlessly blends together. Oh, it's just, there's just nothing like it. It's just so beautiful. And I really do miss being in like a 60 person, like gigantic talented choir that it's, it's unlike anything else truly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, obviously music itself 
is able to play so much into emotion and there's uh, notes can make you feel things and that's insane but I just love it it's so beautiful yeah I kind of miss being in choir too and I have that sort of like nostalgia regret oh, yeah. I didn't take enough advantage of my time in choir in college mm -hmm. and um it's uncomfortable to have that regret but like I know that I chose to do it because I wanted to have more time to make my own music which I don't regret and um that's probably what we'd be left with as like older adults looking back on our 20s is like I don't know dissonance maybe more than regret itself like not it's not gonna be pure regret it might mm -hmm. just be like duality of like I did what I needed to do and I wish I'd had more time to do everything mm -hmm. it's also like being so far away from the person that you were maybe not even understanding your decisions and in in having to make perhaps the same decision at that point in time, maybe wanting to make a different one. Mm. So I think that dissonance probably will play into us as old people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause right now the value could be self-care, but at 50, our value might be like, Oh, I really socializing feels so important to me or like singing with other people feels so important to me that then there's that dissonance that you didn't take more advantage of it in, in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just because, I mean, you're a different person, you yeah. know? Wowza. Well, is there anything else that you would like to say on our podcast, Rachel? Anything else coming to mind? Me Thank too. You very much. And I'm so glad that you were here with me today. Thank you for pushing through the discomfort. <laughs> and up. and um, yeah, I'm just really honored because I know that you said that this feels very uncomfortable um, and performative. Uh, which I relate to, but I also feel like we got a good chunk of time where, where we were like in sync and like not, it, it didn't feel performative for a good chunk of it for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like, especially right after saying, I feel so weird about it, then it just got better right after that. That is the beauty of naming things. Isn't oh, it? And, yeah. and, the, and the beauty of awkward juice. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this is true. Yes. Wait. No, aren't we supposed to do the deep breath together? I thought that was the whole thing. Oh my goodness gracious, you are right. I cannot believe I, I almost I forgot. See your, I see your sweatshirt. Oh, I'm so glad that you remembered that. We would have had to come back. I would have called you and be like, get back on Zoom. <laughs> put your shirt on, put the same shirt on. Do you want to lead us in, in, a, in a deep breath? Sure. Okay, I'll follow your lead. Are we going to do eyes closed or eyes open? <sighs> I'll probably exhale with my eyes closed. All right. Should we just do one? How many do you want to do? <laughs> Probably one. I feel like for like a, a podcast slash visual um, YouTube video, people probably don't want to see us deep read together three times. Right. And the title, it's not plural. I'm not advertising plurality here. We're just- Deep breaths. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do it then. Ready? Oh, you know what? What? I just got stressed and I just remembered that <laughs> I have anxiety about doing deep breathing with people not not in this way not like as we're gonna take one but this happened to me again and it's happened to me so many times but it happened to me again on Thursday when I was in class I get so irritated and I feel like you will get this I feel like you will 100% relate to this isn't it the worst when somebody says okay we're gonna do some breathing together and we're going to inhale for the count of four and then we're gonna hold for the count of four and then we're gonna exhale for the count of six ready let's go inhale one two three four hold two three four exhale two three four here's here's where it grinds my ears after <laughs> after after the exhale then they say something and you're like okay I'm listening to you but I'm yes. keep going on yes. my own so now you're going one two three four inhale hold two three four and then they say let's go again now inhale, oh. one two three but I'm like it's not the same I, I'm holding right now you are throwing me off and yeah. how do you what did you expect me to do in that time that you were talking except to go on and continue the next cycle on my own. I feel like the most considerate way to do it is to is to say what you're going to do. And then just do it. And even to go inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, not inhale, one, two, three. I feel like most people do inhale, two, three, four. I don't know. I, I, have, I have inhale, one, two, three, four. I'm telling you, Rachel, there's some people out there doing some... Even you know, with Adrian, sometimes she'll be like, 
you know, exhale, two, three, four. Now on this next round, try to, and then I'm like, bro, I'm already going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you just throw it off and then, you, and then you have to like, either do like, a, <laughs> like you know, you have to like, you have to cut it short and like expel all the air and then catch up because now, you, now they're already ahead in the inhale. Yeah, I agree. I have, yeah, I'm very, I've got strong feelings about that, but I had to share that. I knew you'd relate. <laughs> oh, boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I'm ready as long as you don't do any absurd counting. I'm not, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to do bare minimum. <laughs> All right. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't do it when I looked at you. <laughs> I was going to laugh, and then that's why I closed my eyes. <laughs> okay. We, do we have to do it again, then? Let's go again. Let's go again. I'll look down. And action. All right, ready? I had already started again, Rachel. Good Lord. Okay. This is what's going to happen. What do you want me to say, then? You what's do it. This... You just have to leave it. Okay, here's what's going to happen. We're going to fully exhale, and then we're going to inhale. Okay, ready? Let's start fully exhaling. And then go at your own pace. You had a great long exhale. I did. I was thinking about what it felt like to sit on this cone. Um, mm. I, I, I managed it for two hours. It wasn't that uncomfortable. Good job. Right now I've got like a spread leg kind of thing happening so I can have better posture. Nice. Um, I love I'm ready time. to I'm ready to go for another two hours. All right. Um you can go. I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you go. I'm just gonna keep talking to myself and explain <laughs> where I got my wine from. You'll have to send me that clip. I must see. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. Farewell. Goodbye. <laughs>